I'm Carl Baldessar, and I'm back in black. Well, if you haven't guessed by now, today's episode is about ACDC song titled Back in Black. It was a song that re they released in July of 1980, and it was a tribute to their late lead singer, Bon Scott, who died on February 19th, 1980, at the young age of 33 years old. His death was characterized by the coroner as death by misadventure. That's one hell of a rock and roll way to go, and it's a great title for maybe a song or an album or even a band. This seemingly easy song is actually very difficult to play well, and I was blown away. I had to learn this song to do this video, and the band blew me away. They are so tight, the pocket is so deep, and it's really a clever song, and we're going to get into that right now. I'm going to break down the key lick of the song, the chords or lack of traditional triads in the song, its overall harmonic rhythm and how brilliantly contrasting the rhythm density is there. We're going to talk about the key signature, or lack thereof, and we're also going to talk about the pentatonic universe that this song exists in. So this great opening descending lick has all of the information of the song in it. It's a descending pentatonic lick, G, E, D, A, B. And if you look at the chords, the chords in the song, there are five. There is E, D, a, and in the chorus you have a B and a G. That's the same collection of notes that are in that lick. This lick has that information in it. And if you look at the melody in the verse, it's the same five notes in the melody. So it's like a DNA strain that has all the information encoded in it that's going to happen in the song. That lick is pretty amazing. The other cool thing about the melody line is how it relates to the chords. So it's actually a call and response with the chords where you have the Back in black, I hit the sack. I've been too long, I'm glad to be back. You see how that melody is punctuating in the space that's created by the punctuating of the chords. It's really cool how they go back and forth and do that. Now let's talk about the chords in the song. What chords, you might ask, because most of the song is just perfect fifths. There is, however, one fully formed triad in the song, and I think the song really has one chord in it. You could argue a second one, but I'll get to that in a minute. The riff of the song, perfect fifths, except you can hear in the bass and sometimes on the rhythm guitar player you hear a third in the bass and so you have a full triad. You hear that C sharp in the bass? Well that gives you a full triad on the A chord. I think that's really the only full chord in the song. You could maybe hear and make a, an argument that during the chorus, when he says, I'm back in black, and he had the G, and they go back in black to the D, the vocalist is actually singing the third. You're hearing that high F sharp there, the third of the D chord. So you could say that that is the other fully formed chord in the song, but for the most part, we're living in a perfect fifth kind of world here, this very kind of quintal sound, quintal meaning five, so there's a lot of these open voicing chords. It sounds so spacious. It's actually very much like what Aaron Copeland would do in classical music, having these very open voicings, and this song really breathes because of those voicings. There's this really cool thing that they do on the chorus, actually, and the chorus is the... While that's being played on the guitar, the bass is pedaling a B, just pedaling the B. And what happens when those chords kind of move and slide over that pedal B, you get these kind of interesting sort of 11th sounds, you know, where I have this A over a B, and that's, that's a really cool sound, and I think that's so cool for a rock song to be having kind of that pedal sound. And so that makes that sort of stand out in my mind. Now before I get into describing harmonic rhythm in this song, which is really brilliant how they do it, I want to point out this contrasting two lines. They have a lick, the descending lick that we've talked about, and they have this ascending figure. And they wrap it around the verse riff. So you have in the verse, you have, you have a lick that's descending. And they repeat the chord. And you have this ascending riff. So you have these two contrasting colors around the riffs, around the chords, and it's really cool. So you've got descending, ascending. 
And that creates a really well-rounded unit when you put it all together with the chords. It's brilliant writing in my estimation. Next, we're gonna talk about harmonic rhythm and the way they use it in the song. But first, I need to explain what harmonic rhythm means. And to do that, I gotta lose my guitar. Ta-da! God, it's magic. So let's talk about this harmonic rhythm of this song. It's really what makes the song so cool and balanced in a really neat way. But let me define what harmonic rhythm is. So allow me to give you a little demonstration. So by definition, harmonic rhythm is not how many times a chord is played, but rather how many chord changes are happening within a bar. So we're not counting the number of times a chord is played, we're counting how many times a chord changes in a bar. So for example, if this is a measure, one bar, and this one is empty, therefore it would be a whole note rest in one bar. Now if I started to fill it with chord changes, for example, in the first verse, the first bar of that chord, of that bar rather, has three different chord changes in it. It has an E, it has a D, and it has an A. Just the number of chord changes in the bar. We're not talking about how many times the chord is struck. And in the first bar of a verse, we have the three chord harmonic rhythm, and the second bar has no chords in it. There are no chord changes because this is where the lick is. Right? So. And this pairing is what the harmonic rhythm or the density or space of the texture of the song is chord-wise in the verses. Now, let's contrast that with what happens as they increase the harmonic rhythm and they increase the density in a fixed space for the chorus. You increase the density, you increase the intensity, and that's what's happening in the chorus. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And so in the chorus, we have bars with five chord changes in them. We have, we have an A, we have an E, we have a B, we have an A, <laughs> and we have, ah, we have a B. So this is the density of the chorus, of one bar of the chorus. So now if you compare the harmonic density of a chorus with the verse, you can see this is way more dense with five chord changes than the first bar of a verse where there's three chord changes. And in fact, if you consider in the choruses that you literally have back-to-back -back bars with five chords in each, look how dense this is. And it's even more dense than you think because it's two bars of five chord changes, another two bars a whole step down, and then another two bars of five chords per bar. So we have six bars with five chords each. It's very intense because it's very dense and it fits perfectly with what's going on in the chorus at that moment. And then if you look at the tag of the chorus where he says, I'm back in black, yes, I'm back in black, watch what happens to the density at that point. You actually wind up with one chord per bar, the G chord and the D chord. And actually they're G5 and D5 in my estimation. But the density change between the verse where there's three plus nothing in the chorus, there's five plus five. And then in the tag of the chorus, you have one and one. All of that changing contour and density makes this song kind of vibrant and alive and breathing. And all those changes in that change of space really makes it undulate between intensity, density, and opening up towards the end of that chorus where he's saying the title of the song, and I'm back in black, and there's only one chord. So he has all this space to declare the title of the song. And finally, as it relates to density and intensity, the most intense part of this is in the coda where they play this lick. And that rhythmic density would look like this.
these are all 16th note textures that are in the lick and you can see how tightly packed and so we have density and intensity at its peak during that riff and during that solo part. Isn't that cool? And they're marbles. And lastly, I want to talk about key signatures or the varying key signatures that are really going on here. But in order to do that, I need my guitar back. So I'm going to conjure it up right now. Voila, my SG, my 62 SG. <laughs> so let's talk about the key changes or the vagaries that are really going on with respect to the keys here. Because you can argue there's maybe four, or even five different key signatures here. Now the sheet music writes it out in the key of E. But actually, when you go through it and you look at each segment, you could say, yeah, that's maybe shifting keys here. So like in the verse, you have a five chord of E, a four chord of D, and a one chord of A. So that really feels like, that feels like it's in the key of A. But when you go to the chorus, that really feels like it's in the key of E because I've got a B chord here and I'm also hitting the E chord. So that feels like it's in the key of E. Then they drop the chorus down a whole step. So that could be in the key of D. And then when you come around to the chorus tag, when you have the I'm back in black, yes, I'm back in black. I mean, that could be either in the key of D or in the key of G, depending on which one you think is the one chord. So all of that can be explained by the fact that there's these shifting modalities because of the pentatonic universe that we're in. And all of that ties back to the opening lick, which is encoded like DNA to have all this information in it. And that's why the key signatures seem to be varying because we're in this pentatonic universe, which is right off the bat, we get that lick and we get all the information that we need about this song. I'm Carl Baldessar. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe, share it, and also leave a comment if you want to tell us something about this video or suggest any other videos you'd like me to do. Take care. So the other cool aspect about the melody... Mm -hmm. The other cool aspect about the melody... Mel I can't say melody now. I just did. I know. All right, try it again. The other cool aspect about the melody line is how it's rhythmically placed in relation to... The other cool thing about this melody line, <laughs> and that's, I feel like I'm, all right. The other cool thing about this melody, me, why can't I say melody? What's wrong? I just said it. Okay, all right. You just can't come say on. melody mm, when you mm, look this All way. right, come on, Billy. Here we go. I'm calling, uh, here we go. Not bad for an old feller. I, I, I'm just tired right now. That's all it is. Okay. The way, just depending on what you, how you, here we go. And then I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, pick it up. <laughs> let's say this. Uh, we've got the biggest balls of them all. Figure, there's a B battle. Uh, <laughs> Try it again, Billy. Beep. <laughs> All right. I know, I know. There's this really interesting thing that. Uh, okay. Wait a minute, Billy. You're right. This You're right. Future Billy. Ooh, future Billy. <laughs> and ACDC wrote this album. Beep. And in fact, oh, by the way, if you compare it to the density of a verse measure, you can see this is way more dense than what's going on in the verse. And in the choruses, we have back to back five chord changes per bar, and this happens two, four, six times. That's a tremendous amount of density and intensity for the chorus, and it fits for the attitude of that moment in the song. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Were you looking pretty good? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quite, a bit. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. That's it.